Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? You know, I'm good. And this morning, I realized I realized last week um, when I was talking to somebody that I don't think Leah and I have introduced ourselves on the show since the very first episode. I think people just join and we're just these we're just these two ladies on here, and that's what it is. So this morning is a great opportunity since I ha we have a different guest today. I'm Allison. I'm the technical services librarian at Fairfield County District Library. Normally I'm on the show with Leah, who is our adult services coordinator, but today I'm joined on the show with Becky Shade, our library director. Hello, good morning. <laughs> Becky Shade, library director. Um, previous to being the library director, I was the coordinator of youth services. So I was a children's librarian before this for a lot, a lot of years. Yeah, well, I'm so happy that you could come today. It's great to have a special guest. There's Sort of, we would probably do more of this if the technical background of this weren't was we're slightly less complicated. Um, but it's nice to have to have a special guest this week. Leah's taking a much deserved vacation. Um, finally, she has a week off from doing the show. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I was excited to be able to be on. So uh, everyone who knows me knows I love to talk. It's one of my superpowers, which is. Yeah. Um, unusual, I think, for people's idea of a librarian, but yeah, yeah. I'm super excited to be here. Yes, I am, I'm the same way. You know, it's just, there's a, a chattiness that you don't necessarily associate with people who work in libraries, and there's certainly a divide. There are those who are not chatty, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have been shushed by customers. Have you, have you ever had that experience? No, I have not. That is a, a feat. Yeah, it was it was okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> probably right. I was probably laughing too loudly. <laughs> so yeah, that's what kind of librarian I am. <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, I did think that maybe at the beginning here we should go ahead and address like the changes in service at the yeah. library. Absolutely. Um, so today is Friday, November 6th um, for anybody who might be watching this mm -hmm. later. Um, and yesterday, Governor DeWine announced um, new, uh, changes in the alert system for the counties across Ohio. Um, and unfortunately, Fairfield County um, is now designated as a red county under that public um, alert system. Um, and, and we have had that uh, before, unfortunately. Um, what uh, the Board of Trustees of the library and myself had decided our plan was that if um, the spread of coronavirus uh, was that large, um, and unfortunately that's what red designates is um, a, a, a lot of community spread um, and starting to tax resources, um, we would at the Fairfield County District Library kind of take a step back from in-person service and provide curbside pickup service only. Um, so what that means for our customers is that uh, you aren't able to come in and browse in the building, but you are able to still get all of the materials you would normally be able to check out from the library. You can do that in a couple ways. You can put things on hold yourself. Um, so you can do that from the library's website, from the library's catalog. Um, if you don't want to do that or you're not comfortable doing that, you could call in to any library location and staff would be happy to put items on hold for you. That's never a problem. It's always um, something we do routinely for customers um, and it's very easy so you can give a call. Um, if you wanted a collection of materials, so maybe you don't have specific titles uh, that you are interested in. Maybe you were just going to come in and look at the mystery section and see kind of what stood out to you that day you can give us a call and we'd be happy to put together a collection of books. You can say, you know, I really enjoy um, James Patterson. I enjoy John Grisham, things in that style. Could you pick me out five or six books um, that might uh, that I might enjoy? 100%. Staff's happy to do that. We will check those out to you. When you come to the library, uh, you're going to pull up in front of whatever location your materials are at and give us a call. Numbers outside so you, so you can do that. Um, and let staff know that you're there and we'll be able to check out your materials and bring them out to you. Um, it does work really smoothly. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's pretty easy. Um, I come Sometimes somebody told me once they, they didn't have a cell phone, so could they still do it? Absolutely. You know, place your items on hold the same way you would have. When you get to the library, you come up and knock on the door, for example, and staff will talk to you through the door. Um, you know, it's it's kind of low tech, but that's okay. We, we are trying to get it done and trying to still be 
safe, not only for our customers, but also for our staff. Um, so that that is kind of our major announcement today, mm -hmm. that change in service. Uh, we had been open uh, since the first week of September, so we've been open for about 10 weeks. Um, but at this point, we, we kind of have to take a step back from that. Um, but we're still providing service programs like this online, curbside pickup. Um, we are also doing a very limited number of appointments for customers who um, have a need to use computers or copiers or fax machines. Um, we recognize, so if you think about the communities that we have branches in, um, Amanda, Carol, Baltimore, Bremen, um, I can tell you, you know, we're probably the only public copier in town in, in Bremen, <laughs> for example. Um, you know, we, we understand people still need those resources. So you can call in, make an appointment um, to come in and do those things, but those are going to be very limited um, based on our staffing and based on, you know, what we can safely do. So that was a lot of time. And I'm sorry, Allison. No, <laughs> no, that's fine. That was all information we needed to hear. And at this point, Yes, we were open starting September, but we've been doing curbside the entire time. So as you said, curbside at this point is moving pretty smoothly, except when I get roped into it um, because I need to cover a lunch break or something. And I'm like, oh, oh, how do I print a receipt? What happens? Um, but I always apologize very profusely to those people for how long it took their items out to them because I'm not used to checking things out to people. And it's not that hard, actually, spoiler alert. Um, but somehow uh, it takes me twice as long. So, but other than that, we're mostly, we're really over the hump of figuring that out, which is great. So this closure um, on that side is actually a relatively smooth transition into what we have been doing. So hopefully, hopefully, you know, people have been using curbside on and off throughout. Maybe the change won't be so dramatic. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, we, we want to provide all the service we can safely within our community and also do our part to mitigate spread. Yeah, um, yeah the curbside service, I would encourage anyone, if you haven't tried it, use it. It's so simple. Um, you know, I, I've done it lots of places at this point in the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and lots of places have it down really smoothly. I, I can promise you, you'll wait less time at the library than for your groceries, for example. Yes. yes. Way less. So give us a try, give us a call, yeah. put things on hold. Um, you yeah. know, we're, we're still very happy to do all of those things. All yeah. of our little resources remain available. All of our book drops remain open so people can return things. Um, you know, it's probably a good time to mention again, we are quarantining returned materials for four days. So they are going to be on your account a little bit longer um, than what you might normally expect. Um, so those items that are returned, we are taking them uh, without staff touching them. We are separating them and letting them sit for four days uh, based on the research study out of Patel. And um, after that point, staff is then checking them in. There are no fines. We have no fines at all anymore. Um, but so people don't need to worry about that. They will be checked in. Um, it just takes a little bit longer now. Yeah. And as far as calling and asking for so spe either specific items to be put on hold or any item to be put on hold, um, that is, so I feel like sometimes people might feel like that that is, oh, I don't want to make them go and like figure something out for me. But in fact, I won't speak for everybody, but that is kind of a fun job to do. It's also our job to do, period. But it's not putting anybody out to say, I don't know. I mean, I like mysteries, but I don't really know what's new. You're not putting anybody out. And it's kind of, it's actually kind of a fun challenge to see, am I going to pick the right things for this person? And let me know if I didn't pick the right things for you and better next time. Um, and people actually even, you know, at my location anyway, there are people who do that even in normal times, they call in and they're like, at a certain point, people become, become familiar with them and we say, well, she reads X, Y, and Z, so I'm going to pull the new A, B, and C for her or whatever. And but people do that even in normal times. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so in the field of librarianship, it's called Reader's Advisory. And I, for me, it's one of my absolute favorite things mm -hmm. to do. Um, I have a great customer story, if I could share about that. Please, please do. Uh, yeah. So um, customer, older gentleman came in um, telling me kind of he wants like this kind of a book. What could I recommend? And, you know, he likes mysteries. He likes conspiracy theories. He wants something that he doesn't mind a long book. Um, and so I ended up giving him uh, 112263 mm -hmm. uh, by Stephen King. 
um, which like I felt like ticked all the boxes that he was, it was history, it was long, it was conspiracy theories, it was, I had read it and enjoyed it very much. Um, so I checked it out, we talked about it, it was great. I told him, come back and tell me how you like it. So he did come back, he asked for me specifically, um, and I went to talk to him and he said, I have to tell you, I hated that book you gave me. <laughs> oh no. You know what? And then and he told me what, but I mean, with no malice at all. It just wasn't for him. Right. Um, but it, it was so, <laughs> it was a funny experience. Yeah. I helped him find some other things. Um, I think I ended up sending him home with Hunger Games that he wanted to read, which was interesting too. Yeah. Um, but that was, for me, that was really funny because I often have people come back and tell me, oh, I love that book you recommended. Uh, but that was maybe the first time someone had sought me out to say, oh, no, that was terrible. That's so, really funny. That's it wonderful. Was, but it also, I mean, it does speak to people. Everyone reads for different reasons, you know, and someone, even people who read the same genre might be reading that genre for different reasons. You know, yeah. they may be reading because it is because of the adrenaline rush of whatever. And if it's the adrenaline rush, you actually might like romance as much as you like horror. Yeah. Because it's about being engaged with that feeling of what is going to happen next. I'm excited for what's going to happen next. But other people are reading romance or horror for completely different reasons. It would never cross those genres. It's just, I don't know. It, yeah, it's funny. It was just funny. So yeah, absolutely. Call in, let us know. We'll be happy to pull a, a, a collection of books for you. Um, works great for kids books too. Uh, you know, if you've got a kiddo that's really interested in dinosaurs or transportation or princesses or whatever it may be, um, we're happy to pull a collection of books like that. Or you could just say, you know what, I need some new bedtime stories to read. Could you pull me 15 picture books? Happily. Although I will say, you mentioned princesses. I'm pretty sure Northwest ran out of princess books like the second weekend to us being open for curbside. I remember Tara coming back and being like, do we have any new books about princesses? And I was like, no. <laughs> just like I've given them all out. Yes. So um, maybe, one of those topics perennially be flexible. Yeah. flexible. yeah, yeah. No, I've been known to like. I'm like, ooh, princess books. We're gonna need to go beyond Disney princesses here, folks. Like some folk tales, some fairy tales. Mm -hmm. some yes, <laughs> and yes, yes. Um, so when we we're talking about um, library services yeah. last week, we sort of teased, and this week I really wanted to talk about um, this show that I discovered on a Dewey, Dewey Decimal blog that I follow. So that's the where I'm at, um, that they posted about. And it was a show from the 1980s on Mississippi public broadcasting. And it was designed, it was created and designed to teach kids how to use the library. Mm -hmm. Um, it is called Tomes and Talismans, and in honor of the 50th anniversary of the Mississippi, Mississippi Public Broadcasting Channel, they are um, releasing episodes on their website like a couple a week up through November 17th. So we've got a couple more weeks, a few more episodes to go. There are actually a lot of episodes. They're about 18 minutes long. Um, they are very instructional about how to use the library. However, they are set in an 80s, like apocalyptic science fiction landscape wherein um, librarians had to scramble to preserve all of Earth's human knowledge because this alien and race was coming in and invading and taking over the planet and all the humans were being transported to a different solar system to escape. And so they wanted to preserve all the human knowledge in like an underground library for, I guess, if they came back or something. That part was a little unclear to me. Um, and so the I mean, it's a public broadcasting show, so I don't know exactly how to describe the production value, but it's all very high given the fact that it is a show to teach people how to use the library, I think. Yes, for sure. Um, I would I would agree with that. It, it, it was kind of really a big, a big concept, a big idea. You know, they're yeah. talking about like subjects and categories and, you know, how do we find the author? And of course, you know, it's the 80s, so the card catalog figures very prominently. Yes. Um, which yes. people my age really enjoy. Um, <laughs> to, like, yeah. Oh, I got I got some real nostalgia for the card catalog. Um, so we have someone in our comments who says that she has actually heard about this show. She says, I don't remember where, but when I was a kid, I do remember hearing about it, which is very impressive and exciting to me. Um, and yes, there's a lot of card catalog, um, which is fun to watch because that's would be my job. That's my job is based on, and everything I do is based on the format of a card catalog, even though that's not even what we use anymore. We use certain 
like in my job, I have to do certain punctuation and spacing and things when I'm describing resources, all because that's how it was on a card catalog. And then that was just transferred directly to computers. And it doesn't even really need to be that way anymore. But we had all the information on these cards in a certain format. And so we just translated it exactly. So it was really interesting for me to watch that. Um, and also to think about how much more human work used to have to go into everything. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. so just a couple episodes. I had not heard of it as a kid. For me sure. either. <laughs> um, but I, so Allison turned me on to it and I watched a couple episodes and really it, it I enjoyed it. I, I don't know yes. that everyone would enjoy it, <laughs> um, but it, it's definitely brought back some good memories for me. Um, you know, like we would, we would watch PBS shows like at school sometimes. I don't know that that still happens. I don't think so. I mean, obviously not right now. Um, but even in regular, like the film strip day or the day you got to watch like a T that was a big deal. Um, we didn't, we didn't watch Tomes and Talismans. Uh, there was a lot of, um, three, two, one contact at my school. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an old, uh, PBS like science show. Mm -hmm. Um, and <laughs> I could sing the, the theme song for you, but I won't. Um, so <laughs> maybe we'll have a special feature bonus blooper deleted scene reel at the end of all the lattes with librarians. And we'll feature that there. There you go. Yeah. Tease that now for sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, PBS figured very prominently um, into my childhood. I know Allison and I were talking. You too, yeah. right? You you yes. watched a lot and of PBS. Andrea mentioned also that she watched Three Two One Contact as well. Apparently, Andrea is very well versed in PBS. My mm -hmm. shows were much more um, of just the broad spectrum of what everyone of a certain age watched on PBS. I watched Mr. Rogers. My mm -hmm. memories of Mr. Rogers um, are always very fond, naturally, mm -hmm. um, but my mom was pregnant with my brother and I have very specific memories of, I would sit down and I would watch Mr. Rogers and she would take a nap. And that was like, like in my mind, I was, it was my time to watch Mr. Rogers and that's what was exciting. But looking back, I realized that it was, she was able to put me in front of the TV and not feel bad about it so that she could take a nap because she was, she was pregnant. Yeah. Um, and so it all worked out for everybody. But I just remember watching that and really being, super engaged with what was going on with Mr. Rogers and then also reading Rainbow for sure. Yeah. Um, which, you know, that I even like the, essentially what would be reading Rainbow for adults, which is like us talking about books on here. That's, that's what I still like to do. <laughs> LeVar Burton is an American hero. Let me just state Agreed. that very clearly right here. He made generations of kids read. I watched Reading Rainbow as a kid. We would watch that at school sometimes too. Yeah. I loved Reading Rainbow. Loved yeah. Reading Rainbow. Yeah. And I know that probably you and whatever probably already know this, but just he did narrate the audiobook of the biography of Mr. Rogers. So if you really want to just feel good, you can listen to The Good Neighbor, which is a biography of Mr. Rogers narrated by LeVar Burton, and you just feel, and he has a great reading voice, obviously, so, um, but you just feel really yeah. safe. All is right with the world when LeVar yes. Burton is reading about Mr. Rogers, you know? I yes. Absolutely. We have some comments, uh, if, well, Scotty Miller asks for you to please sing the song, but we might. Yeah, I, I will contact Scotty Miller offline and sing <laughs> Thanks, Scott. And um, also I mentioned that PBS and Nickelodeon were staples in uh, their childhood. And that definitely for me too. I mean, we are slightly of different ages, Becky, mm -hmm. but Nickelodeon certainly was, I mean, I funneled straight from PBS into Nickelodeon, watched a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, Nickelodeon. So I didn't have cable TV as a kid. Mm -hmm. So I didn't um, watch a ton of Nickelodeon myself, but one of my aunts did. And when I would go to her house, we would watch Nick at Night. And the show I remember watching the most was Mr. Ed. <laughs> I watched a lot of Nick at Night, too. I watched Nick at Night. I mean, that was what I watched in the summertime, mostly. But I have to say, Mr. Ed did not hold my attention. I don't I, I don't know. I'm sure we watched other things, too. But that's what I remember. <laughs> no, that's hard to forget. Because, yeah. I mean, I didn't watch a lot of it either. But I still do remember his like talking horse mouth and yeah, yeah. <laughs> clearly I remember have really great memories of it based on the look on my face. Yeah, no, so it, it is for sure. PBS. And, yeah. So there's a lot to talk about there. I did want briefly to just give a little bit more about to entice you into clicking 
going to the Tomes and Talismans website, anyone listening. Um, one, there's a lot of great synthesizer, if that is important to you. The colonization by aliens, they're called the wiper race because they're like wiping out all data and communication technology. They look exactly like humans who are just crazed kind of and angry um, and throw things around and like laugh and make weird noises. Um, and so the head librarian whose name is Ms. Bookhart, she um, she is trying to find this one volume. There's one missing volume of like this, you know, history of the wipers colonization of Earth that's missing. And she thinks she knows where it might be. And so even though they only have two hours to get on the last transport out of Earth, she goes to track down that book. Um, as we are diligent people, right. library, library staff. Um, but I think that we would probably most of us draw a line there and say, you know what? I'm going to have to catch that last bus off earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she goes to find it. She can't she gets stranded. And then a universal being coming to you on a golden Zephyr um, comes to her and puts her to sleep for a hundred years. And so she wakes up a hundred years later where these other race of creatures, well, they're all humans, but this other, they're not the humans from earth. This other group of people are studying human human, you know, everything that was left behind, all the human culture. And um, they find her and so they're using, she's gonna help them use their library to like defeat the wipers basically. Um, there's a lot of teaching of how to use library resources. There is a lot of time spent on alphabetization, which is. Yeah, yeah, I feel like, you know, maybe we could have glossed over that a little bit, but yeah, yeah, it, it is important. I mean, it's fundamental to what we do. It is, it is. There's just a lot of times, but BY becomes after BE. And you're like, and you work in a library? Yeah. Um, but it is, it is, even in the first few episodes, there's a lot that's jam packed. So I think we'll have the, uh, the link in the comments if you are interested in watching this crazy 80s show. And if it reminds you of something else that you had watched in your childhood or whatever, we would love to know. Um, we have more comments. Mary loved Mr. Ed and Green Acres. I, I get, Mary, I get the Green Acres theme song stuck in my head regularly, which seems unfair. Also all in the family. Mm. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then we have, Andrea wants to know, do we remember the show, The Letter People? I remember the letter people, but I don't know it's the same thing that she's talking about. My um, kindergarten had, that was how we learned the letters. Like each of the letters was a person that started with that letter. So Mr. T, for example, I remember had tall teeth and he was the shape of a big T with gigantic teeth. Okay. Um, um, but I don't know that it was a show. And I don't know if that's the, the same thing she's thinking of. Well, we'll have to we'll have to look that up. I cannot do two things in one at once, which is be on the show and Google the letter people. But we will have to look that up and see if we remember it. I don't think I have any zany PB. I watched Zoom a lot. Mm -hmm. um, my brother and I used to watch that at my grandma's house. I don't know why. Well, I think I do know why because she didn't have cable. So we were watching PBS at different hours of the day than we normally would. Mm -hmm. um, and... I re we really enjoyed that too because the kids like the kids were the stars of that and they just did all these fun activities that like kids would want to do and taught you about stuff and told jokes and it was just this multi-format thing and we really liked zoom yeah i i watched a ton of sesame street as a kid like tons and tons of sesame street you know those the maria and bob and mr hooper they were like my family <laughs> Um, no, no discredit to my actual family, but they, I mean, like, I felt like it, you know, when, when Big Bird, you know, Mr. Snuffleupagus was, a, was originally Big Bird's imaginary friend and no one else could see him. And then Mr. Snuffleupagus came to life and he was like a real, Snuffy was a real a, a person, animal. Creature. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I did not know that he was once not real. Yeah, no, there was this whole thing on Sesame Street, like Big Bird would talk about his friend, Snuffleupagus, Snuffleupagus, and nobody else could see him. So like it was an imaginary friend thing, but then Snuffy like 
eventually like cemented his role, I guess, and was real. Um, yeah. I did not know. Um, we have another comment. I think Andrea left the link for the letter people. And she says that Mr. T seems to have tall teeth. So we'll have to check that YouTube video out in the comments and see. And then Carrie um, said, remember Between the Lions? And I do, I do remember Between the Lions. And she also watched Zoom. So clearly I think Carrie and I were watching like right about the same time because I believe that Between the Lions came on like before or after <laughs> Zoom at one point in time, at least at the PBS station where my grandma lived. <laughs> Cause I definitely associate the two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Weren't you, yeah. Becky, you were telling me something about a junkyard yesterday. Oh, so like Sesame Street, when it was first um, created, they very specifically wanted to set it in an urban setting to be able to reach um, kid and be relatable to kids in an urban setting. Um, Cause most TV shows, especially for kids really weren't like that. Yeah. The first few seasons, I think Sesame Street started in 77, maybe? That sounds... Around there, 76. I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. um, but around that time, like, one of... We have these DVDs at the library of, like, the first seasons of Sesame Street. And they're probably available online now, too, different places. But um, one... <laughs> one of the like controversial episodes were the, some of the kids like playing in a junkyard. Um, and you know, that maybe not like the best place to play. And they had to do this whole thing. I don't know if anyone else remembers this. I was telling Allison about this. And, and it she, did not ring a bell for me, but. So like when I was a kid, he, there, there were things that were dangerous and one of them was strangers and one of them was quicksand and one of them was abandoned refrigerators and like getting stuck in an abandoned refrigerator. So like if you were junking your refrigerator, you had to take the door off. Like that's just, that's like the rule because I, I mean, I guess I assume this happened to somebody, which is horrible and I'm sorry. Um, but like Sesame Street had to like, I don't want to say print a retraction exactly, but like do it's some work around it. Yeah, like if you play in junkyards, don't play in abandoned refrigerators kind of, I don't know. It was <laughs> those first few seasons, I think were maybe a little rough. They they got more polished as, as time went on and yeah. maybe abandoned the junkyard <laughs> format. Uh, you know, just had Oscar then and that was yeah. okay. Um, but, yeah. Sesame, yeah. Street started, Sesame Street started in 1969. Oh, wow. Wow. Leah, Leah is joining us. Welcome, Leah. It's nice to see you in the comments. Uh, <laughs> she says that she remembers mornings about abandoned refrigerators. So it, it must have been a slightly generational thing that I was just a little behind. Um, right, right. Like, they just, it was one of those things, like, you don't play in abandoned refrigerators. It's I don't know. Advice. It doesn't, it is good advice. It doesn't yeah. seem um, maybe to be real pertinent to modern, modern life. I don't, I don't know. Um, refrigerators also used to have like really old refrigerators, like would latch, like you had to undo yeah. the latch to open them. And that's probably a lot of it because like my refrigerator now, well, my refrigerator is kind of crummy. So um, the, the seal is already relatively loose, but I feel like even if it were tighter, you push the door that would probably open, but those old refrigerators with the metal thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So definitely check out those first few seasons of Sesame Street. They, you know. <laughs> yeah. Carrie says that quicksand was definitely not, did not turn out to be as much of a concern as she thought it would be. For right. me, it was never quicksand. It was the Bermuda Triangle. Like mm -hmm. I could not stop thinking about the Bermuda Triangle and like, what, what if one day I'm flying by plane somewhere and we just, you know, we blow off course and then I end up over the Bermuda Triangle, you know. Um, yeah, instantly gone. Pew, yes. Gone. gone. Um, you, I know we're kind of getting, we're getting close on time, but I know you had a specific Sesame Street 2020. Did. Um, so this is uh, The Monster at the End of This Book uh, by Grover, which many people are familiar with and was a favorite of many, many people as a child, myself included. Um, and I had seen like a meme of, you know, if 2020 were a book, you know, this might be a good representation of it. You turned another page. You do not know what you are doing to me. Now stop turning pages. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's Grover. Oh, um, he's so depressed. Yes, like in the book, if spoiler alert, if you haven't read it, you know, he he there's a monster at the end of this book and he doesn't want to get to the end of the book because there's a monster there. And as the reader, you keep turning the page and reading more of the book and he keeps getting more and more concerned. And the whole book is about how he's, you know, he's tying the pages, he's doing all these things to like make you not keep turning mm -hmm. the page. And I think somebody was drawing the analogy between like the calendar pages keep turning in 2020 and like, stop, yes. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. If we were going to talk about Sesame Street, I had to had to bring my friend Grover into it. Yeah, that's really cute. I I was a fan of Oscar. Mm -hmm. I was a fan of Snuffleupagus. Um, yeah. Because, I don't know, I didn't realize, I, but my whole, not that I like him any less for having once been imaginary, but just that was not my perception of him. So I'm going to have to like sit with that new information for a little bit. Yeah, um, no, it, it was, it, you know, and like, and Big Bird would be like, but he was just here. He just had to leave. And everybody else was like, it's okay to have an imaginary friend, Big Bird. And Big Bird's like, no, he's not. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Big Bird. That also yeah. sounds kind of dramatic to mm -hmm. definitely know someone exists next to you and everyone's telling you mm. oh, this, is, this is becoming upsetting um i did see a, a meme myself about about the end of the year like on new year's eve and it goes from 11 59 to like 11 60 and like 2020 just <laughs> continues it's like we don't actually roll over <laughs> we were talking about turning the calendar pages that reminded me it's like what if you turn the calendar page and it's just like it right. never actually becomes January of a new year. Well, here's what I know. If that happens, I know who to blame. It's the wipers, no doubt. The wipers, for sure. That is that is for sure. So we should all probably get on watching that show so we can learn how to defeat them using the power of the library and the Dewey Decimal System and alphabetizing works. <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you for joining us today, everybody, and Becky. Um, next week, we'll be back. We'll have another special guest. And... Uh, I look forward to seeing you all then. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Great to talk. Bye.